This is the Gang of Witches Ibiza podcast, hosted by Joe Yule. Each new moon, we'll explore with our guests how to think globally and act locally with ecofeminism. Awaken all your senses. The spirit of the witches comes to your ears. Welcome back to the Gang of Witches Ibiza podcast. And in 2019, I was asked by the BBC to go and record part of a radio show called The Conversation, which looked at women working in war zones. As I entered the home of today's guest, I was enveloped by a sense of calm and also one of being warmly welcome. But listening to the interview I was there to capture for the World Service left me shaky and on many occasions close to tears. I was devastated to hear the stories of little children being killed in Syria and the regular bombings of schools, which now amount to over 1,000 in the last decade. Hospitals have also regularly come under attack in the country. And the fact that Rolla Hallam, who is a doctor, was there by choice to face all of this and attempt to pick up the pieces where possible reminded me, not for the first time, that there are two types of humans in this world. The ones that live for themselves, their inner circle and sanctum, and the ones who live to help others and be in service. The contents of that conversation stayed with me, and so much has happened since then. But the fact that we are still facing this storyline in Syria, and now these kinds of targeted attacks on the vulnerable have also begun in the Ukraine, made today's conversation feel important to understand from the perspective of a frontliner how to begin to process what we're seeing right now, and perhaps where we can begin to help. Voller is a doctor, humanitarian and human rights campaigner, saving children's lives on the front line. She's the first Syrian TED Fellow and founder of Can Do, a humanitarian organisation supporting frontline health workers to save lives in their war-devastated communities. So in this episode, we endeavour to find out what drives her to continue this work, but also to try and better understand how we can all cope in times of war, what self-care we can put in place, and how to deal with such harrowing events none of us have ever really had to face previously. Rolla, thank you so much for joining me here on the Gang of Witches Ibiza podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Beautiful to be here. So, Rolla, I think before we dig in to the abundant story bank of all that you've experienced, I wanted to set a little intention for this interview that we can provide a little bit of support along the way to those actually listening as well. I don't want this podcast to be deeply disturbing or such a hard listen that people tap out. And I'm also not sure how helpful that is either, because I think, you know, there's a real sense right now that life has been heavy and it's been that way for a really long time. And what touched me the other day when we met up was that you were telling me about a pair of boots you wore to work, but you had to go home and change them. I just wonder if you could maybe start there for me. What what actually happened? So... I had gone to the chiropractor to finally deal with some of the chronic pain issues that I've been suffering with, which I now realize is trauma that I have held on to for the last few years. And as I finished the session and I went to put my boots on, something really extraordinary happened that has never happened to me before. I I suddenly was looking at these boots, which I have been wearing for over 10 years, and It was like I started to feel their energy and this like story started to appear in my mind of 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 me walking around in these muddy fields in the winter of 2012 around these um, informal displacement camps in northern Syria. I was wearing their predecessors at the time and I my feet were getting wet and soggy and I was like I need to buy a new pair of boots and so I did and and just started to remember all these places that I had walked around with these boots all of the just the disasters that I had seen from a bakery being bombed and rushing to help people to you know 
just seeing the ghast, the ghastly faces of people who were just in shock and trauma, just looking at me like, like pleading with me, like, please help me. And this whole like catalog of stories and events and emotions that just flooded me. And I just found myself just suddenly bursting into tears, staring at these boots, thinking like, I need a new pair of boots. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> it's thank you boots we, you've you've done well for the last 10 years we've been on a on an epic journey but i like i struggled to put them on and i literally had to go home and and change them before i carried on with my day because i i just um yeah they were just radiating all of my past and the last 10 years in in painful beautiful but um at the time overwhelming ways did you break up with those boots? <laughs> I'm still deciding what to do with them. I'm like, what do I do? Do I like pass them over? Do I throw them in the bin? Do I just like read a prayer and ceremoniously burn them? Like, I'm not quite sure what to do with them right now. They're still sat sat at home. Um, I mean, it's a testament to Turkish leather because they're like they're they're still bloody brilliant. Do you know what I mean? I feel a bit like loath to throw them away because I'm like, there's you know my like I don't like throwing things away. You know, like normally they get worn until they're dead, but they're not dead. But they're just like sat there going, "You've been through war. Do you remember everything?" And I'm like, "Oh God, scary boots, go away." Yeah, I think maybe a ceremony sounds like a good one for those very uh, <laughs> understanding boots. But my God, the warrior shoes, I think um, I would never, ever like to, to put those on. And I, yeah, I can really understand that, you know, they've, um, they've been with you through some very, very, very tough times. I think, you know, with this phase that we're in now with Russia attacking the Ukraine from all angles and more often than not seemingly in the way that you've personally experienced in Syria, you know, during your time there as a doctor with pregnant women and hospitals and children being targeted, as we've been seeing. Uh, how has this made you feel and what has this actually stirred up for you? Hmm. Well, I've for the last year, I've I've gone on a big healing journey to sort of finally really deal with the trauma, grief, loss and burnout that I've faced this last now 11 years and and had and I had gone, you know, I've done pretty well and I've gone quite far along that journey. But then when this war started, I've been so surprised with how triggered I have felt. And I finally realized what, you know, all trauma experts know, which is that this trauma that we hang on to, it, it acts at the biological and the physiological level. Honestly, it's all been subconscious and involuntary. Um, it's like my body has reacted it's like a body memory, a cellular memory that has been activated. And especially because Katy, my sister-in-law, is Ukrainian. And when I have been talking to her and she's telling me about her family, her parents, her sister, who are in Krakow, which is one of the cities closest to to Russian border and how heavily under attack they are. And just the, the anger, the sense of helplessness, the frustration, the sadness, the panic, the overwhelm, everything that she was describing just transported me back to 2011 and 2012 of being in exactly the same situation. My family was all in Damascus and in Syria. I was in London and I was watching it, you know, first, obviously, the peaceful protests, because it's really important that we remember that this in Syria all started with peaceful demonstrators who were calling for freedom and for dignity. That's how it all started 11 years ago. They were calling for freedom and for dignity. There were peaceful protests that then the regime um, attacked and tried to crack down on and respond to instead of with reforms, but with bullets and guns um, um, and violence. And And I just remember seeing it unfolding on this on the screens and you know, calling my dad and my sister and, you know, like asking them, are they okay? But the phones are tapped. And so you couldn't say anything of value. And so they kept saying like, yeah, yeah, everything is fine. You know, it's all being blown out of proportion. And I'm basically saying all this BS that I knew wasn't true. And we started to try and talk in code, having never agreed the code, you know, because it just suddenly happened. And, and just remember feeling so just heartbroken, excited, excited that 
my countrymen, women and children had broken the fear and found their voice and that we were there finally protesting against an oppressive regime that has been there for far too bloody long, but just so scared for them and just so horrified at the response that was happening and unfolding. And um, I just feel her. I feel the Ukrainians. I feel for everybody who's been through trauma, especially war related, because I think we must all be feeling so triggered right now. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly why I wanted to have this conversation, because, you know, clearly you've had, you know, frontline experience of these kinds of scenarios. And, you know, we're all kind of spectating from a a very safe and humbling distance, but it's it's affecting everybody. I don't think anybody knows what to do or how to deal with this because none of us have actually ever really been through these kinds of times before. And and to, to, to look on from a place of, I mean, disconnection really through a TV screen and a, a news channel is not, just doesn't give you a sense of being able to do anything. You know, you, as you said at the beginning, the, the helplessness is is real. And I think it's um it's very difficult to know how to navigate that at the moment. And I think, you know, no matter who you are or where you are, you know, you feel like you should be doing something. Um, and it's quite difficult to process that feeling of helplessness on a, on a daily basis. Mm. Well, I think what's really beautiful that I'm witnessing and seeing so much is so many people who are trying to help and to do something, whether from close by at the border areas of, you know, in in Poland or in any of the other countries where people are opening their homes and letting in refugees to, of course, other organizations, local as well as international. And, and, you know, even people, you know, here on the island and in, in, in other places who are doing fundraisers. So I think it's important to remember there are so many people who are trying to do in their own small way something positive and proactive about it. I think that for me, one of my most profound lessons about this has been around um, learning about the difference between empathy and compassion and how that radically alters our response to when we see other people suffering. Because What most of us do is we witness someone else suffering and we feel their pain, right? We are feeling with them. And what often happens is, for example, you see little Aylan Al-Kurdi, you know, little child dead on, you know, drowned on the beach and you imagine it as your child and or any other sort of tragic scene. And what most of us do and I actually was doing this absolutely as well, is we imagine ourselves in that situation. We imagine ourselves as their parent, their sister, whatever it is. And what that does is actually activate the pain centers in our brain. And what do we do when we're in pain? <sighs> You're repulsed by pain, right? Like if you've touched a hot plate, what do you do? You you, you withdraw from it. And so it actually acts in within, we act with an aversion right? It causes distress because it literally activates the same pain centers as if we ourselves felt pain. Um, And that when it's chronic and repeated and keeps going leads to empathetic distress. And that can then carry on, can lead to burnout and other sort of huge health outcome, you know, negative consequences. And so what we have labeled as compassion fatigue is actually empathy toxicity. It's actually empathy overdose. What neuroscientists have now shown, I mean, you know, what they've shown what the wisdom traditions have told us for years, for centuries, for decades, for millennia, in fact, that compassion doesn't fatigue. Compassion is infinite, but we don't actually know how to practice compassion. The difference with compassion is you feel for that person. And so you are connected to it, but you have not dislocated that pain onto yourself. You haven't taken it onto yourself. It remains with that person and you remain in connection to it. And so actually what what they've found when they've studied the images of, you know, of, um, subjects who are practicing compassion in functional MRIs where they look at brain brain scans, it activates the reward centers, the feel good centers of our brains. Um, And so we actually end up with pro-social behavior. We end up with the motivation to help instead of the motivation to close our eyes, hunch our backs and turn away. Um, And so it's a profoundly vast 
response. And I think that that's the crux for me about how we all need to learn to deal with that suffering of other people is to be in compassion with it and in, in an open heart state to it, not taking it on as our own pain. That's so interesting. And I think, yeah, I mean, definitely, I think we're all, you know, a bit fatigued in general, really. But I think emotionally, we're all, you know, a little bit done in, but nothing compared to what's obviously just kicked off, you know, in the last month. And it, it, it is very difficult to handle on a daily basis. So that's a very interesting idea to explore how to, you know, change that narrative and relationship, you know, with the source of pain and the source of um, extreme feeling, you know, if you didn't feel something, then I don't know what kind of person that could be. I, I, I It's certainly not my experience or anybody that's that's around me right now. I'm interested also, I, I, I think, you know, you talk about your journey with, um, with everything you've experienced, but how has that changed since you've become a mother? Hmm. Interesting. I mean, for everything that I've been through, through war and, and, and everything that I've witnessed, um, becoming a mother has just been the most singularly transformative experience. I think what it did for me was bring me back and ground me back in my feminine power. Having for years, I think because I've been working in a war zone, it's a male-dominated atmosphere in a male-dominated society. You know, running my own organization, that meant that I was trying to be decisive and ambitious and all of these sort of masculine, more masculine traits. And I think having Naya brought me back into the gentleness, softness, but fierceness of the feminine, which feels much more open and inclusive and still absolutely powerful, but somehow more relaxed a more inspiring collaborative creative space from which to be as opposed to that sort of more single-minded you know direct more fighty more fighty forcey <laughs> place that uh, I think I was in um, um, for very many years um, I do have to also say that it's just I'm a pediatric anesthetist I'm a children's anesthetist and so and and most of my work in Syria and before was about child health and so that's always been the focus but and so I've always had that affinity to children but it's definitely now made it so much harder to see children suffer um, because now that you have your own child and you just see how much you worry about them, you know, like Naya's got a cough and a cold at the moment and I'm like, oh, poor Naya, you know. And and so it's definitely also made it that much harder to, um, to witness children suffering um, and but also given me so much more love empathy and respect for the parents and what they must go through as well especially in these places where you just can't provide them with the basics we're not even talking about luxuries this is not your child wanting a bloody iphone this is you can't protect them you can't give them proper shelter you can't give them proper water you can't give them proper food i mean i can't even begin to imagine what that must feel like as a parent when you can see that you're not able to provide your child with these basics it must be heartbreaking. I mean, that was what I was going to ask you next. Actually, is is who do you who do you think is most affected by war when these kinds of situations kick off in your experience and everything you've observed? I mean, who is war? I mean, is war gendered in that respect? The ugly reality is that war affects everyone, even even the the predators, even the the people who are committing these heinous acts because they too have mothers and sisters and children and um, I just can't, you know, whether you're the, the dictator, um, you know, like, like Assad or, or Putin um, or whether you're just the foot soldier, you know, I just can't imagine the darkness that they have within them to either be able to commit these acts of hate or to what they must have to suppress within them in order to do that. So the ugly reality is it affects everyone. But, you know, at a civilian level, what we all know is that it 
most often affects women and children, right? Men go to war, that has its own suffering, but it's often the women who are then left with having to be heads of households, often in societies and other places, though not always, where they haven't been um, uh, provided the tools to be able to do that, you know? And so you suddenly go to the head of a household having to look after everything from elderly parents to your children to the affected community. And, you know, women end up being the absolute pillars. You know, I remember in 2013 with um, one of the organizations that I used to be the medical director for, Hand in Hand for Syria. It's a British Syrian led organization. And we were going around um, to the newly displaced, very close to the front line, providing food baskets. And, um, and I remember meeting this incredible matriarch. I mean, the the lines on her face each spoke a thousand words. It was incredible. She really reminded me of my grandmother, God rest her soul, in her traditional dress from the sort of rural tribal regions. And and she told me about how she had grabbed the hands of her grandchildren in the dead of night to walk over dead bodies and walked for miles and miles to get them away from the front line and into safety to the house that was completely disheveled with no windows but that was now home for that for that period and she was the backbone of the family you know as I looked around the room there were her daughters and their children and there she was this towering pillar of strength who was marshalling her whole family to safety um, incredibly stunning to see and she, I would say, has been my biggest teacher on compassion. She had told me how um, about a week before the Syrian regime soldiers had arrived in their village and she told me how she had gone to speak to them and she said, my son, what are you doing here? We shouldn't be killing each other with, from the same place. Why don't you go home to your wife and to your children? And he told her that he hadn't been allowed to see them for three years. And she said they just sat there and cried together. So incredibly powerful when we can, when she has that level of humanity to be there with her supposed enemy, but to think of him and to be able to just sit there and, and be human together and in that vulnerable state. Um, beautiful. I mean, she sounds absolutely incredible. And um, yeah, I mean, what compassion that is to be able to, to sympathize and to sit down and to have that conversation in that situation. It's just, yeah, I think you've said it before when I've listened to other interviews that you've done and, you know, you see the best and the worst of humanity uh, in these scenarios and that definitely screams to me um, yeah definitely definitely the best I think our last episode um, was about migration and obviously we're kind of seeing now um, with the levels of displacement you know war can as you just described you know be incredibly gendered because for example, in 2015, 244 million people were displaced and 80% of those were women. And in the last month or so, the latest data from the UN Refugee Agency reveals that more than two and a half million people have fled the war in the Ukraine. And I, I mean, I, I just assume from everything you've just been saying as well that, you know, many of the men are obviously staying behind to, to fight and to do, you know, what they need to do. But I feel like, you know, the increased refugees... Um, and, you know, the crisis that we're in and those facing displacement are mostly women and children. So I kind of wanted to ask you, like, how would you describe what that's like at a time like that, you know, to leave your own home um, in those kinds of times? Because it's essentially what you were forced to do and also a story that you're so familiar with. Um, growing up in Syria, you know, the war obviously wasn't happening when, you know, when you grew up there. So that's a massive, massive transition for you and for all the other women who are forced to flee their homes. Yeah, I mean, I think we just have to always remember, like, no one wants to leave home, not by choice, not in those circumstances. Um, you would never put yourself or your child in a rubber dinghy across dangerous waters if 
if you weren't leaving an absolute hellhole, if you weren't in a position where you thought you had certain death versus the possibility of survival. Um, you know, recently Syrian um, refugees in Germany were, were, were surveyed and 92% of them said they wanted to go back home. People want to be home. We all want to be home. And yeah, in 2015, I was part of um, uh, an incredible group of feminist um, advocacy trip that uh, comprised of some Nobel Peace laureates, um, feminist organizations like um, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and Physicians for Human Rights and um and we went to trace the route of refugees across the Balkan, um, starting in Serbia, culminating in Germany, um, in order to better advocate for the rights of, of women and girl refugees. And it was just so incredible to see people on that journey. Most people had very little belongings. Um, the most treasured and prized belonging is having a mobile phone. Most traveling with the clothes on their back. Many had no idea where they were going. I mean, there were a couple who were like, yeah, we're, we're heading to Sweden. I'm like, I had to tell you, it's quite far away from here. You're not on the right tracks, you know. But so people like just some of them had no idea where they were going and how they would even get there. But it's putting one foot in front of the other, driven by an incredible, ancient, ingrained innate state for survival and and of course we saw many women and children along that route but for me being a feminist isn't about women for women and women's rights for me being a feminist is about being grounded in feminine power and all of these qualities and fighting for the most vulnerable and in my experience of being on that journey and, and, and witnessing refugees, that was to love and care for the boys, the dozens and dozens of dozens of so-called unaccompanied male minors, boys who are 12 to 16, who are there in big gangs, looking forlorn, looking lost, their children, for God's sake, you know, and they had escaped either Afghanistan because they didn't want to join the Taliban or Pakistan or Syria or Iraq. And they'd just been, you know, sort of sent off by their families to find a better future. And we often actually almost demonize them, you know, like, and you know, them as well as men, refugees. And we find somehow empathy and for, for women and, and, and children, but somehow not so much for for these groups, and they end up being trafficked. They end up being a highly vulnerable um, group of people. So, so absolutely, women and children are most affected. But we must also, this is the thing about compassion, right? That state of open-heartedness, all our collective aspiration is to not make it conditional. Not make it conditional to what you look like and you sound like and where you've come from. And like we're seeing, sadly, in, in now in, in the Ukraine refugee crisis, you know, you're white, come this way, you're black, you can piss right off, you know, like, no, you know, you're Syrian being beaten up, you're white and blonde, you're welcome. That's not, that's not. That's not what our, the beauty that we are capable of. Um, we let ourselves down when we when we do that. So it's really about embracing everyone um, because that's ultimately what we would want is to be embraced when, when we are in pain and suffering. Absolutely. I mean, that's definitely, I would say, the, the, the biggest time when we want that level of love and, and support and openness to be rescued and be be held and um i just yeah i mean it's just oh it's so intense it's so intense even listening to this it's it's made me just want to say something related to that you know i think for this last 11 years i have been on stages in the media <laughs> and often just speaking in my head to just one, to tell people what's going on and open their eyes and open their hearts and make them feel connected so that we can together do something about it. And, you know, people talk about compassion fatigue and people are disconnected from it. My, my, 
my experience has always been that when you tell these stories at a human level and you share it in such a way that enables people to connect with it, but also feel empowered to do something that actually most of us do care and most of us do act. But I feel like the thing that stops most of us from being able to bear these scenes is that we haven't really truly learned how to deal with pain, especially our own. Most of us deny our pain, distract away our pain. We don't attend to our traumas. We, um, we can then go a step further of being super critical and judgmental of ourselves, of our hurt, of our pain. We can be driven by blame, guilt, shame, and judgment. Um, I've been there. I've been there myself. You know, the number of times where I would, you know, I would feel sad or heartbroken about something and suddenly this nasty voice would be like, what are you bloody moaning about? It's not your mum who was raped. It's not your house that was bombed. It's not your child who was burnt. You know, what are you complaining about? Shut up and get on with it, you know. And and I would judge myself so badly and would just not give room for my own hurt. And what that eventually led to is what I was talking about earlier, that, that empathy, distress and toxicity. And actually what that ends up doing is I literally got to the stage where I just could not look at anything anymore having spent years making myself face it, making myself bear witness, making myself look at thousands of awful videos thinking, well, if I'm trying to get people to connect to it, I can't be the person who turns a blind eye. So this is my duty, you know, and I would practically force myself. But I got to a stage where I couldn't. And as I started to practice compassion, but especially self-compassion, loving kindness to myself, when I started to acknowledge my own pain, my own suffering, not relative to anyone else, not belittling it, not making myself feel bad for it, but embracing it and embracing myself with everything that I've been through, that suddenly this contracted heart and these walls of protection that I had built around myself started to melt. And bit by bit, by more and more of this compassion practice, I was able to reconnect with other people. I was able to reconnect with that suffering. I was able to reconnect with those, with that news and with, with, with witnessing it, but from a very different place. I now don't do what I used to do and imagine that child as my own and then be repulsed by it. You know, it, it happened just a month ago. Um, I'd read in Syria that a school was bombed and three children were killed and my initial reaction was put my phone away I was like I can't I can't deal with that and then I remembered the compassion training that I had done and I literally just <sighs> took a deep breath and imagined that I was there with their mothers and I just said like I can't imagine what you're going through and I can't make it better but I will just sit here and be with you during your pain and suffering And I just sat for a moment with that. And it was incredible, Joe. I felt good. It felt good to be with them in their suffering because I didn't displace it onto me. I wasn't in empathy. I was in compassion. I was open to that. I was just being there for them. It was, I know energetically across the space and time and everything like that, but I didn't, it, I didn't turn my, my eyes away and my heart away. And I think that comes from the self-compassion that I've been cultivating. And I think that is the one thing that we can all, and not only can do, but must do, tend to our own pain, suffering, trauma, love ourselves so that we can love others. Once upon a time in Ibiza with Alex Gray. Travelling through time, I reflect on the sorrow, the horror, the front line. I journey within to the life in me, a blossom of love, the only seed of truth I can see. The war-torn alleys of blood and fear, they fought for freedom, dignity, yet 
it has not appeared. I speak to you as the mother, human lover, not a fool. There I stand a doctor at the bombing of the school. Life is dying, babies crying. Can you see us? Can you hear us? Relentlessly trying. I scramble for the pieces of the shattered world outside. I rage with pain and anger at this man-made genocide. If it breaks for one, it breaks for all. The branch of hope and existence, we will all fall. Tanks, guns, we gather, we run. A pilgrimage of souls fleeing towards a promised land. A land of peace, a land without war. I woman, you man. This is not just the story of a passing of time. I am still here with the bloodshed drowning in war crime. The war is within us, how can we heal? As within, as without, we must commit to feel. I build a place for shelter for the wounded and the sick, but the shelter in my heart holds the magnitude of this. I am a woman of this war. I find my power in my mud. I build my village once more. <laughs> Where do you think that journey begins when you say that, you know, you turn to your training, but before that moment, you know, that even just adding that pause of turning away, you know, in disbelief and horror and, and, you know, going back into the the toxic side of that emotion? How do you, how do you put that pause in place initially? and, and, And where do you begin to tap out and transform that emotion into something else? Mm. I think for me, the fundamental shift happened when I got pregnant. So when I was pregnant, I finally realized that to look after someone else in this, in this instance, it was my little growing belly and my little baby inside of me. I finally realized that to look after her, I needed to look after myself. And it was like, it sounds so obvious, right? When you say it, and, and I've been told it so many times before, but somehow it had just never become an embodied knowledge. But suddenly I realized, my God, if I want to heal the world, I can't walk around deeply wounded. You know, if any of us want to destroy structures of prejudice and hate you can't hate yourself you know if you want to be a peace activist you can't have a raging internal war we have to embody these things these changes that we want to see in the world it fundamentally starts from within us and then it reflects out into everything and everyone around us and so to learn that in order to change the world, we need to change ourselves. And that that fundamentally also means putting the oxygen mask on ourselves first and tending to ourselves, to our wants, to our needs, to our desires, not from a place of selfishness, not from a place of self-centeredness, but as our highest act of love and compassion for ourselves and for others. And so I think when we make that shift and realizing that, then we start to do the work that we really need to do on ourselves. And then we start to be in that profoundly empowered place where we know we can therefore make a much bigger impact on the world in whichever capacity we are there to serve. I mean, yeah, I never a wiser word spoken. I think you've obviously spent a bit of time sorting a few of these little uh, thoughts and feelings out. Well, I'm quite impressed, actually. I feel like perhaps you should go into uh, psychology and, um, well, you are obviously, you know, moving into that um, potential field of um, of helping other frontliners and coaching other frontliners. And, you know, I, where do I sign? Yeah. (laughs) Here is the dotted line. Yeah, absolutely. I think that after this year of going, like I said, on my own healing journey and spending hours looking at what do the what does neuroscience, psychology, behavioral sciences, as well as the wisdom traditions teach us and spending bloody thousands of pounds on it and, and, and hours on of my own healing, I'm now it created a really fundamental shift in the work that I want to do. It's always been about helping other frontliners, whether you're a health worker, aid worker, therapist, emergency responder, social entrepreneur, campaigner, whatever. I was always about before about getting them funding, but really now it's about how do we 
make sure we're doing the internal transformation we need in order to transform the world? And how do we put at the very heart of that, that self-care? And um, and how do we learn to put the oxygen mask on ourselves first so that we can go forward into the world and create this you know, beautiful impact in the beautiful world that we all want to see. So, yes, very exciting new chapter. What well, can we go back to something I think I mentioned in the introduction about, you know, what I think it's very interesting. I and mean, there's another podcast that I listen to called Awake at Night. And I, and I, you know, it's made by the UN Refugee Council um, by Melissa Fleming. And well, she's the presenter of it. And she's always talking to um, other you know, kind of frontliners, really, who essentially go to war zones and and do the kinds of work that you've also done. And I I find these stories just utterly astounding. Every time I listen to them, I mean, they're utterly captivating, but they're also, my jaw is often really on the floor about what makes a frontliner a frontliner. Or, you know, I wanted to be a foreign correspondent on the first opportunity that I had to go into what felt like a war zone. It was a bombing in London of the tubes. And I could not handle it. I did not want to go. And I rebelled deeply in my mind when I was asked by my editor to go to the scene of that bombing. And I, I was I was pooing myself. I really didn't want to go. But, you know, how do you clearly, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure nobody goes, oh, I wouldn't oh, I'd love to go over there. I mean, I'm sure that's not the narrative in one's mind. But at the same time, it's like what makes somebody able and willing and wanting to be in service and put themselves in those kinds of situations and risk everything for another? Absolutely. I mean, it's a fascinating question that has um, often occupied my mind. You know, is it nature or is it nurture or is it a combination? I know that for me, I feel I was born a doctor. You know, I I remember growing up in Damascus, being age six, playing with my siblings and my cousins and insisting on being the doctor who was performing the life-saving surgery on our Barbies and Cindy's. Um, and um, so for me, it was something that was there for from, from seemingly forever. Um, and so, you know, I can't speak for others. I think there's certainly a combination of nature and nurture, I would say. Um, but I, I also think that it's we each have to figure out our own way of being of service. And um, what you're doing is of service, but we all choose our different ways of doing it, you know. Um, and um, an acorn can only become an oak tree, right? And and I think we just have to, our job is to be as authentic to ourselves as possible and, and do it in the way that we feel called to. Um, I think for a lot of people, you know, when you see injustice or when you see prejudice in whichever form, you know, you're called to do something about it. You somehow have the belief that you do have power to change it. Um, And thank God, because I absolutely believe that we can. And so I think a lot of people are called to to that activism, to that campaigning, to that, you know, action on the front lines. But I think also for a lot of people, they find themselves in those situations. I mean, let's talk about um, Syria, for example. I spent all of my time working with fellow Syrians, either who were there in Syria or the diaspora. And what I now know is that actually the reason that people survive in crisis is because of the remarkable work of the people in crisis themselves. You know, people survive because of the local doctors and nurses and aid workers who are from the heart of the affected community they are the ones who know exactly what their communities need, when and how. And they are the ones who are willing to risk their lives to save others in the way that um, others, even within the same profession, part of the international NGO you know, system, are, are not willing or able to do. Um, and whilst on the one hand, you can say it was a choice, because yes, no one forced me to be involved and no one forced them to be involved. But it was also, um, there was an aspect to it where we found ourselves in you know, this situation and, and, you know, and, and you do make a choice. You know, you say, do I get involved? Do I not get involved? And of course, there's a bunch of people who end up being either pro or against or sitting on the fence and, um, you know, 
um, what Martin Luther King Jr. you know referred to as a sort of almost the most dangerous group of people who are like the indifferent, you know, who who are not trying to be part of the solution and in so being are part of the problem often. Yeah, it's fascinating. Love to love to explore it and understand it one um um again and you know it's it's definitely been one of the things that I talk to about fellow frontliners, you know, what is that motivation? What 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 was that moment that made you kind of go, "Yep." Yeah, death, I see you and I raise you one. Here I come. I think you just summed it up there. I mean, I didn't, that wasn't, that wasn't my moment. And it was a moment that showed me something about myself that I probably suspected existed there. But when you say you knew you were born a doctor and I I feel like I was born a foreign correspondent, I knew that I was going to be reporting from war zones. But actually, when push came to shove, that wasn't, that wasn't there. I wasn't willing to die to probably disseminate information that probably necessarily wasn't that impartial either and actually the more I explored whether I really wanted to die to deliver information it didn't feel I don't know it didn't feel like it was even you know my life wasn't being sacrificed to help another really necessarily I think there's slightly different things but I I just it interests me because I think that moment for me was quite pivotal in terms of what I did after that because I didn't managed to achieve what I thought was my life's dream and it was interesting um, and showed me something that I didn't yeah necessarily think would be the case so it was kind of an interesting one well um, I hear you and and I think like I said it's important that you know we follow our life's path but I've you know I also have been involved in um, the creation of two BBC panorama documentaries one back in 2013 called Saving Syria's um, children and and again um, just last year um, Syria schools under attack and you know in both instances they came about by incredible journalists you know Darren Conway and and in in Ian Panel um, of the BBC wanting to tell that human story and wanting to tell the human suffering of ordinary civilians and. And that's the role that they played, and it's a fundamental role because we need these stories to be told. Um, and our media, so often, as you said, is is subjective and doesn't tell us the full truth, and doesn't, um, you know, will often tell us the bang bang stories. Um, which was my frustration with Syria, which is how come I kind of came about to try and, and push. You know, I remember in 2012, I was sort of walking around these displaced camps and I was thinking like where the fuck are there journalists like why is no one seeing the suffering that I'm seeing why is no one reporting the suffering that I'm seeing why is it that every time I look at the news I'm seeing about this army and that faction and it was all about the armed aspect of it but not the human cost of it and I think that's the power that powerful human-centered journalism can bring to it especially when it's collaborative in that sense and 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 the team ended up following me and my fellow um humanitarian and doctor dr saleha and um and you know they captured well nothing short of a horror scene of when we witnessed a school that was bombed with a napalm like bomb and and we had dozens of severely burnt children who came to our hospital and that all unfolded in front of the camera and absolutely one of the hardest days of my lives it's it's absolutely etched on my mind heart and soul and and actually I, I was so glad if I can put it that way that it was captured on camera and it was shown to millions and millions of people around the world because I I wanted people to know what was happening I didn't want anyone to say I didn't know because you know and I think it's it is extremely powerful when we can when we can when we can show that but marry it with an action that we can take so that we don't end up in that like holy shit like this is awful what can I do beyond be, besides crying because you know crying doesn't save lives you know we all want to do something about it and I think that's that was the difference that we did last year with the Saving Serious Schools campaign to go with the documentary that we made. I don't think that unfolded like by accident. It's kind of like, what are the chances of that happening when you've already got a BBC crew there? And the fact that 
this action and what you witnessed and what was recorded and captured and disseminated, you know, changed changed lives, you know, changed the survival um, and has also been a catalyst for your biggest campaign at the moment, which is to obviously install these alarms in schools so that the kids have warning that, you know, there's a potential bombing on the way and have time to get out. And I think until those kinds of scenarios, which are, I cannot begin to even imagine, I mean, I don't even want to talk about it because I know I'm going to have a have a little moment, but I think, you know, how how would a solution ever come unless something horrendous happens and that is then, you know, shared uh, to, to millions. And the work that you've done is is just impeccable and incredible and beautiful story in terms of like the change that that's inspired you to make and the work that you've chosen to do and the path that you've chosen to go on. So I don't know, you know, do these things happen just like, you know, it's kind of like it's quite unbelievable really that that happened at that exact moment in time. Yeah, I'm... I'm I'm reminded of that story of when um you know this person is sitting there and always saying you know oh god oh god why is all of this tragedy and suffering happen why is this happening why aren't you doing something and you know eventually god gets fed up and says I am doing something I sent you to help and and I think that's that's just how I feel about it. It's like, you know, we, we've all been given a capacity and ability to do something in however big or small that might be about whichever subject matter we happen to be, you know, captivated by that has caught our hearts, whether it's climate change, you know, racism, sexism, whatever it is, but to, to find something and to do something about it. And, and you know, that... That experience of of being there on the front lines, but not only having to deal with the absolute horror and and shit show of of dealing with severely burnt children who were dying in front of you, um, but what really broke my heart was that you know that day I had the training and the capacity to administer potentially life saving treatment to those children. I should have been able to give them all sedation and put a plastic tube into their throats and put them on a ventilator and send them in a medically escorted ambulance to Turkey to get their tertiary referral, you know, their specialist care. Um, But instead, despite our best efforts, we had to send many of them choking in pain, in distress, in the back of their parents' cars, um, because I, the frontliner who could have saved their lives, didn't have access to the tools, resources, and equipment that I needed. And I swore after that that I would do what I can to not have other frontliners suffer that, because it's 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 you know it's what we call the moral injury of doing the work that we do. It's one thing having to deal with it, but when you When you know you are not providing the best care that you can, and you know that's because it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't exist, it exists, and it's plentiful around the world, but it's not there in the hands of those who need it most, who can save the lives on the front lines. And that was really the catalyst for founding Can Do. It's all about supporting a locally led humanitarian response, but with that global support. You know, it's all about what can we all do from around the world to support those who are leading the response, who are from the heart of the community. And instead of the the current hierarchical humanitarian system where you have, you know, you know, white man, white woman flying in saying, here's what you need and here's what you're going to do and, and, and sort of imposing that often on the local community. Um, it's about all of us saying, Who's there? Who needs what? What do you need? How can I help you? It's a relationship of equals and it's one where you are absolutely appreciating and realizing the power and the knowledge that these locals have and supporting and bolstering their initiative and their work instead of coming to either take it over or working in parallel, often therefore disempowering um, you know, that local response. I mean, I, I remember talking to you after that interview um, that I recorded back in 2019 and about, you know, potentially us perhaps even, you know, doing some kind of podcasting work together. So I really, really wanted to come to <laughs> to come to Syria. And it was so interesting to hear about, you know, the work that you were 
inspiring and facilitating with can do and and the fact that you you said to me well actually it w- wouldn't be that easy for you to be there and do that because all these women that we use and we work with are actually locals and they're Syrian and you obviously wouldn't be able to communicate with them or record anything and I just love the fact that you do use you know local local communities to help local communities because I think you know we were talking about this earlier and you know the fact that localization in that respect just like with you know as in the cure to climate change it's it feels like that support network and that work that needs to be done you know it cannot be done by what cannot be done in the same way or be as effective as uh you know importing kind of global um solutions i think local solutions are always the way forward as we've talked about a lot on this on this podcast so i'm kind of interested to hear more about you know why it is that you feel that the the local support network is the key yeah so as i said it was absolutely my personal experience i was seeing that it was the Syrians where they like I said in Syria or the diaspora who were who were there in the eye of the storm who were there in with bombs falling around them um there absolutely were a few um a handful of other international NGOs um like uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and Médecins du Monde they were there especially at the beginning um um but you know the majority of international NGOs um like the UN etc you know they're often in the refugee areas doing important work we absolutely need to support and help refugees but they are not there dodging bombs it is often the locals who are doing that and there was one piece of research that really blew my mind and and it was absolutely my experience but to see it in numbers was really like whoa so um local to global research had found that um in the Syrian context um 75% of the humanitarian work in Syria was doing being done by Syrian organizations 75% right that's the first thing that most of us don't know we do imagine it's to save the children's and all of these other organizations that were doing it um and that we're sending money to and that you're sending money to and um but actually for doing 75% of the humanitarian work do you know how much of the funding they get do you want to guess 20%? 1%. Oh my god. That's just absolutely horrifying. And it doesn't just happen in Syria, it happens in all of these contexts and places, um especially in the war in war affected areas, less so in disaster areas, but um you know, natural disaster areas, but it's often the locals, it's the Somalis who are helping Somalians, it's the Yemenis who are helping Yemenis. Of course, there are international groups, but it is mostly your diaspora and your own fellow countrymen, women who are there to support. And so, you know, that is leading to millions of people suffering unnecessarily around the world because those people are not getting the funding and the resources that they needed and and it's not just that, that it's about it's not just about that um resourcing right like if you think about it once a war is over or even before a war is over and funding has dried up as it has in Syria and interest has waned as it has in Syria even though the war still goes on it is those pillars of the community who were left to stitch this wounded fabric of society back together it is them yet again who are left to try and heal these wounds and and bring the country back up from its knees or 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 worse back up and so if we don't support globally support these local initiatives then not only are we not helping them um in that acute phase but we're not helping them to regenerate we're not helping them to redevelop and then they become one of those fragile countries that are prone to violence and poverty and um you know and and um and as we have seen in lots of places where healthcare has been decimated like in western africa can become hotbeds exporters of disease you know the ebola crisis came from some of the countries where their health systems were destroyed and they were not rebuilt and as you said earlier you know our healthcare system has been decimated mm-hmm. not accidentally but because of purposeful systemic targeting of healthcare and healthcare workers as a weapon of war why did why did they do that because that's exactly what we're seeing in the ukraine and every time i see a pregnant woman on a stretcher 
who hasn't made it and neither has her baby I'm like why would you know this is just I just can't I cannot 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 understand it it's evil isn't it it's literally like the face of evil is that and um I mean if you think about it it's bloody clever right like how do you best break the human spirit and terrify a civilian population you make no place sacred you take the places that are most sacred and you make them highly unsafe and if you think about it it does do that you know if you terrify that's how you get people on the move it's how you create um you know a displacement crisis um and you know what really breaks my heart is that for years i've been saying it is not just our problem that our hospitals are being bombed like hospitals are there protected by the geneva convention and international humanitarian law for our collective protection and if they break for one they break for all and i remember saying in 2015 like if you allow this to happen in our land then you are giving the signal to to new wars to future wars that bombing hospitals is okay because the international community will just stand there and do fuck all about it and look at what's happening i mean i was devastated the other day when a children's hospital was bombed in the ukraine i spoke with one of my colleagues who is an incredible woman she's a pediatric nurse who has literally been injured with life threatening injuries 10 times she's had her spine broken her neck broken she's been burnt she has had so many tragic injuries in the line of duty looking after children in Aleppo the sorts of injuries that frankly at the thought of them most of us would go oh fuck this i'm out of here and she would recover and go back to Aleppo to carry on serving and to carry on looking after children and i spoke to her the other day the day that it happened because i just like literally messaged all my friends because i thought if i'm distraught i can't imagine what they must be through because actually they were there when all of their hospitals were being bombed and she just said i I mean you know they've all got PTSD they're just literally just reliving she's just like there's a film show going on in my head I'm just reliving it I just can't think of what they're going through this is it's, it's just like a horror show you know um so it's imperative always always that there is accountability that there is justice that we do uphold these norms um and that's why you know we have to put in power leaders who will actually do that who will lead um it's why we need to reform the united nations and some of these major you know organizations so that they will actually uphold these international laws so that they're not just a flimsy piece of paper who that mean fuck all there's obviously a lot of work to be done and i think you know i feel like this has been really really helpful to talk about some of the themes of covering self care and um how to transform emotions and how to you know stay more in our compassionate heart than our empathetic one i'm really grateful that you've managed to to share some of that wisdom of your experience um i just think you know want to finish with obviously your work for can do you've done some unbelievable things including this idea of getting these um alarm systems fitted in schools you've done the first or created the first crowd funded hospital you've set up 12 week programs for psychological support networks for local communities of of women to kind of you know deal with the trauma of what's been happening to them and also a children's magazine um for for the same kind of purposes and i think you know this is work that really is inspiring and needs to be supported so just lastly before we um we close um what you know how can anybody contribute to the amazing work that you're doing because obviously i think as we've just talked about a lot is is this feeling of helplessness and and where to contribute where is the money best spent because i feel like in the ukraine i don't know where to send my donation where is it actually going to be utilized in the best possible place and as you've just highlighted perhaps it isn't with save the children or the very obvious international kind of bodies that you know it's the local ones that we need to really do a bit of research and actually plug in to um put the money there rather than in the obvious places Um there's two things I want to say um as we wrap up. First of all, absolutely look for and research local organizations um for all the reasons that we've just talked about. 
Ukrainians need our help and they need our support. And, um, and I think the, the more that we can get those resources as direct to the front lines as possible, the more impactful, efficient and effective that they are. That is not to say that if you support some of the other international NGOs, the money isn't going to get there. It will get there, but it will go there through a circuitous route. Um, um, losing a lot of value along the way. Um, so absolutely research and find these local organizations. Um, and the final thing that I want to say is something that I've learned along my journey of um, about guilt. I think so often when we see and witness this horror, we end up feeling guilty, even ashamed about the fact that we are living in safety, that we do have an abundance, that you do have the food on your table and and all of your comforts, if not luxuries, and, and, and you can feel guilty about it. Guilty doesn't really save lives. Um, it certainly can lead you to action, but it will not make you feel good. And what I want to encourage all of us to do is to turn guilt into gratitude. One of the most powerful things that I've developed is in those moments when I literally am about to feel guilty, when I do go like, oh God, you know, um, I can't believe I live in safety and these people are suffering. Now I just take a moment to give thanks for what I have, for the blessings that I have. Um, I I make a wish to share it with anyone that who needs it and and sort of recommit to doing what I can um, to help others. But coming from that place of gratitude is it's like elevating our vibration and coming to it from a place of positive positivity as opposed to being driven by guilt. And it's such a not only does it feel good, but I believe it's much more impactful. So um, please don't be consumed by guilt. Please turn that into gratitude and that um, again into action. I absolutely believe that we can all make a difference, big or small. Um, and so um, it's really about all of us standing in that power, working together. That's so important, supporting each other's efforts. Um, and um, daring to make that world a better place. So to support Can Do and their amazing work, head to candoaction.org. Rolla Hallam, thank you so, so much for joining me here on the Gang of Witches of Ether podcast. It's, um, you know, obviously a massive thank you on their behalf as well. And um, really appreciate you uh, making the time to join me today. Thank you so much. Hi, Gang of Witches. <laughs> <laughs> It was the Ibiza podcast of Gang of Witches, hosted by Joe Yule. See you at the next new moon. Until then, take care of yourselves. Everywhere I'm calling upon my sisters everywhere.